All right, can everyone hear me? I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen. All right, can you guys see that? Fantastic, okay. Um, so my name is uh, Encore. I am a uh, second year uh, internal medicine pediatrics re uh, resident at the University of Miami Jackson Health System in Miami, Florida. Um, I apologize from the get-go uh, if I sniffle or cough during this presentation. I'm just a little under the weather, uh, but let's go ahead and uh, get started. So I'm gonna talk about pediatric wilderness medicine. This is actually a talk that I gave for um, like a, our equivalent of a grand rounds uh, a couple of months ago. Um, the objectives of this lecture include um, recognizing various environmental emergencies under the realm of wilderness medicine, understanding their pathophysiology, clinical presentation, then also learning how to appropriately manage these emergencies given potential limited resources that can happen prior to hospital admission, and then also how to give appropriate anticipatory guidance to patients and families to help prevent these um, discussed uh, environmental emergencies. So we have a clinical case. Uh, we have a 17-year-old boy, Chico, who's gonna guide us through our adventure. So Chico is a 17-year-old boy who just graduated from high school. He's planning a cross-country adventure to explore as much of the natural beauty in the US um, has to offer before starting college. So uh, before leaving Miami for his trip, he and his friends rent a boat and are out partying in Biscayne Bay. He's challenged to a diving competition, though he's not the best swimmer. He downs his white claw, uh, jumps in the bay because he wants to impress the girl he has a crush on. Several minutes pass and eventually when a buddy goes to grab him, Chico is found unresponsive in the water and not breathing. So Chico ended up drowning. Uh, drowning uh, has a very wide clinical presentation. Um, the clinical appearance ranges from patients appearing nearly normal to appearing dead. Uh, hypothermia is pretty common, even in warm waters like those of Miami. Respirations for patients may be completely absent or be labored. The lungs can be clear or you could hear rails or ronchi. And then the neurologic exam also varies a lot. It can be, um, patients could be completely alert or completely altered. So what happens when, um, when someone drowns? So fresh water is aspirated into the lungs. That is rapidly taken up into circulation, resulting in a transient rise in the circulating blood volume and resulting hemodilution. This hemodilution causes denaturation of the surfactant that's in our lungs. Even a small uh, volume of one to three milliliters per kilo, uh, kilogram of fresh water can cause surfactant to denature. Salt water aspiration, a different process happens. Um, so there is a decreased intravascular volume and resulting hemoconcentration. Salt water creates an osmotic gradient for fluid in the lungs, and then this ends up diluting surfactant. So they have two different mechanisms, but essentially, uh, the end result is still the same. Uh, there's a rise in surface tension in the lungs, uh, leading to alveolar instability. Capillary and alveolar membrane damage allows fluid to leak into the alveoli, causing subsequent pulmonary edema. And this is what um, ends up killing people. So here is a chest x-ray. On the left, you can see uh, bilateral disseminated um, like alveolar patchy infiltrates, more so than um, on the left side than on the right side of the lung. This is pulmonary edema in a patient who drowned. The x-ray on the right side of the screen, same patient a couple of days later after being hospitalized, excuse me, and undergoing um, appropriate treatment. So you can see that it resolves. So in terms of more of the pathophysiology, both salt and fresh water end up decreasing pulmonary compliance, increasing airway resistance, increasing pulmonary artery pressure, and then this leads to a decrease in pulmonary artery flow. What this ends up doing is causing uh, intrapulmonary shunting. So if you remember from uh, physiology and whatnot, this is when you have alveoli that are being perfused but are not appropriately ventilated. So there's an increase in your AA gradient. This leads to hypoxia. Hypoxia leads to CNS damage, which happens about like four to six minutes after uh, the hypoxia sets on. So what, what can we do um, to kind of uh, help these patients. So studies have shown that outcomes depend mostly on the duration of submersion, the degree of aspiration, and the effectiveness of the initial resuscitation effort. Deterioration happens as the pulmonary, the pulmonary edema worsens. 
And this process can be rapid or delayed up to you know, half a day to a day later. Um, a retrospective study of children presenting to the ER after warm water submersion suggested that hemodynamic rather than neurologic status uh, was more highly predictive of poor neurologic outcome. So basically what we have to remember is our basics, right? So our ABCs, um, that's always the, the, the cornerstone of uh, resuscitation, even in patients who've drowned. And it's very important that we don't delay CPR in these patients. This is an algorithm for the inpatient management of respiratory distress in the setting of drowning. This is beyond the scope of this lecture, but it's in here in case you guys want the slides later um, to see how like, you can manage these patients once they're actually admitted to the hospital. Now, in terms of epidemiology of drowning, uh, in the pediatric population, you'll see that um, ages one to four, uh, these patients are the leading cause, or drowning, I'm sorry, is the leading cause of injury death in these young children. Once these kids get older, so five to 19, it's then the third leading cause of injury death. So as children get older, the risk of fatal drowning increases. More than 50% of open water drownings occur in children that are under the age of 15. And then over the age of 15 years old, 75% of the teens that drown do so in open water. The reason why is kind of what you'd expect for teenagers. Um, they tend to overestimate their skills. Um, they're more likely to use substances while they're around the water. And then they engage in more high risk behavior than younger children do. Now to quickly talk about racial disparities in terms of these statistics. Um, so uh, this CDC study from 1999 to 2019 showed that uh, fatal drowning rates were higher for black children under the age of 17 compared to the rates for non-Hispanic white children or uh, Hispanic children. Now, why could that be the case? Um, now, 64% of black um, children, 45% of Hispanic or Latino children and 40% of white children have little to no swimming ability. Uh, studies have shown that if parents have no or a very low swimming ability, there is a very high likelihood that their children won't have good swimming skills. This has been demonstrated in approximately 78% of Black children, 62% of Hispanic or Latino children, and 67% uh, of white children. Um, the thing is that this is, a, this is a systemic issue. So many public swimming pools were closed for Black families um, back in the historical times who didn't have the means to join private clubs or pay for expensive swimming lessons. This lack of access to public swimming pools continued even after desegregation in the 1960s. So since the 1960s, Black families have continued to have limited access to public swimming pools. And this report um, showed that uh, as a result of limited access to swimming facilities and swim lessons and the unappealing design of most pools that were earmarked for Blacks at the time, swimming did not become integral to the recreation and sports culture within African-American communities. All right, so what can we do for our patients and our families? How do we kind of tell them about drowning and give them anticipatory guidance? Um, so the best thing is participation in formal swim lessons. This can reduce the likelihood of childhood drowning by nearly 88%. You wanna make sure that you ask your parents in clinic, you know, if you're a pediatrician, if the children know how to swim. Ask the parents if they know how to swim. And um, if they don't, uh, you can call, you can encourage them to call a local aquatic facility uh, and ask for a Red Cross program. So the Red Cross, uh, if you go to this website, redcross.org slash take a class, depending on your location in the United States, they offer free classes um, at various aquatic centers for people to learn how to swim and for children to learn how to swim. So it's a great resource to give to your patients in clinic or in the ER or wherever you are. So besides learning how to swim, because obviously if you know how to swim, you won't drown until you tire out, right? Um, we want to make sure that we tell parents to provide close supervision for toddlers around the water. Uh, tell adolescents to swim sober when they're out on the water. Tell this to your adult patients too. Uh, you want to make sure that they're using U.S. Coast Guard approved life jackets. Um, so it specifically has to say that on the life jackets. And that younger children should have jackets that have a collar for head support and a strap between the legs. And also reinforce that water toys do not prevent drowning. They're not the same as having an actual um, uh, Coast Guard approved life jacket. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and continue our adventure. Um, Chico has lots of stops on his little, uh, on, his, on, his, uh, on his trip. So after nearly drowning in Miami, Chico began his adventure by flying to the mile high city of Denver. While hiking the Rockies with his friends, he noticed that he had a nauseating headache 
As they continued to climb, his friends observed that Chico was getting right, really out of it. Initially, they thought it was just the brownies they ate earlier, but uh, by the end of the day, Chico began vomiting and faded near the top of the mountain. He was not responding to questioning when they tried to wake him up. So this time, Chico went ahead and got himself altitude sickness. This happens when um, someone has sudden altitude ascension. That's uh, known as greater than 2,500 meters or greater than 8,200 feet without any uh, climatization. So this, uh, this amount is equal to about 6.5 Empire State Buildings or 3.3 Burj Khalifas, which is the tallest building in the world. It's located in Dubai. So what happens? Um, so increasing altitude ends up uh, resulting in a decrease in inspired oxygen or PiO2. This leads to a decrease in the uh, arterial oxygen, PaO2, and thus the um, arterial oxygen saturation, which is SaO2. As the PiO2 decreases with ascent, the driving pressure of um, the alveolar O2 down the oxygen cascade diminishes, resulting in progressive hypoxemia and thus tissue hypoxia. Um, now, what fixes this is acclimatization. Um, so acclimatization um, improves tissue oxygenation by increasing alveolar PO2 and the uh, efficiency with which oxygen actually moves down the oxygen cascade and by optimizing the, the utilization of oxygen at the cellular level. The process of uh, acclimatization usually begins within minutes of ascent, but often it requires a couple of weeks to actually uh, complete. So delving into a little bit more of the deets here, um, there's a couple of responses that uh, cause acclimatization. So there's this thing called the hypoxic ventilatory response. So when, there, when you get hypoxic at a high altitude, uh, your minute ventilation increases, causing a, a resulting respiratory alkalosis. Now, um, this usually uh, happens after like four to seven days because initially there's renal compensation via excretion of bicarb to continue um, the hyperventilation that happens. So this is where uh, the medication acetazolamide or Diamox ends up working uh, in your favor. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Another thing is overall, there's an increased net cerebral blood flow uh, when you acclimatize to a uh, higher altitude. So the hypoxia causes vasodilatation. The hypocapnia causes constriction. Um, however, uh, the vasodilatation usually kind of out uh, like wins in terms of um, the vasoconstriction. So overall, there's a net increase in your cerebral blood flow. There's also hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, which results in an increase of the pulmonary vascular resistance and the pulmonary artery pressure. And then well, within a few hours, the hypoxia stimulates hematopoiesis, resulting in an increased hemoglobin within two to four weeks. So like, no, that's two to four weeks, not like you know the first couple of hours. Um, so initially alkalosis um, causes a leftward shift of the oxygen dissociation curve. Um, then, it also uh, stimulates production of 2,3-DPG, which ends up shifting the oxygen dissociation curve back to the right, which is just you know normal. Now, this process um, is great. It's maintained until you hit very, very high altitudes. At that point, once you hit super high altitudes, the effect of the alkalosis far outweighs the capacity of the red blood cells to produce more 2,3-DPG. So then after you reach a certain altitude, um, the, there's like a more permanent leftward shift of the ODC or the oxygen dissociation curve. And then uh, you start to decompensate. Now, how do you recognize altitude sickness? There's multiple types. Uh, there are four major illnesses that are seen with altitude. Um, there's high altitude headache, uh, which is often the first symptom of climbing to a higher altitude. It may occur alone or it can progress to acute mountain sickness. So acute mountain sickness is what um, our boy had. Uh, this is the most common presentation of altitude sickness. Um, so this is when you have headache plus some other symptoms. So either nausea, vomiting, fatigue, difficulty sleeping, or dizziness. Onset can be delayed for like six to 12 hours from the time of ascent, but it can have rapid onset as well. So sometimes they can have it run away. Um, symptoms are often the most severe after the first night, and they generally resolve in one to two days if there's no further ascent. Um, and you, uh, and then once you uh, like acclimatize to a specific altitude, 
uh, they the symptoms don't usually recur as so long as you stay at that altitude. Uh, the next uh, disease is high altitude cerebral edema. This is super rare, but it's life threatening. Uh, the thought is that uh, there's like vasogenic edema that um, explains the pathophysiology that underlies this, uh, but it's still kind of unknown. Uh, patients end up presenting with ataxia, lassitude, which is just you know exhaustion, uh, progressive mental decline, and loss of consciousness. This is more likely to happen above uh, 3,000 meters and can occur from anywhere between 12 hours to three days after ascent has started. Now, the thing that kills people uh, is high altitude pulmonary edema. So this is the most common cause of death. Uh, patients usually present with a non-productive cough, dyspnea on exertion, and difficulty walking uphill happens about two to four days after ascent. Now, the thing is that um, Young, younger individuals may be more susceptible to uh, HAPE or the pulmonary edema because they have immature control of breathing, frequent respiratory illnesses, and the way it presents in kids is like a viral illness with mild respiratory distress. So like, if you don't have a high clinical suspicion, you could have kids die uh, with the pulmonary edema very fast. Um, so it's just something to look out for. Now, the way you prevent altitude sickness you tell your patients to stop ascent and acclimatize at the current altitude to cease the progression. So what we tell them is to climb high and sleep low. Sleeping elevation should not exceed the previous day by more than 300 to 500 meters, and rest should occur every three days. Now, if physically fit individuals are following these climbing guidelines, you don't necessarily need to prophylax them, uh, but if people are planning a rapid ascent, then you can consider giving them a cetazolamide or diamox. So acetazolamide uh, inhibits the renal carbonic anhydrase, um, which leads to bicarbonate uh, diuresis. So this ends up basically allowing your body to continue to have that respiratory alkalosis um, that your body kind of innately does. Because remember how I said after a couple of days, your kidneys kind of kick in and then um, it kind of just stops the alkalosis from progressing. So this kind of keeps it going. The dose for acetazolamide is 2.5 mg per kg BID in children with a max dose of 125 milligrams per dose. Um, and then you give it uh, for up to two to three days after people hit like their max altitude or that they're uh, anticipating for their trip. There are other medications that you can also use, specifically dexamethasone, which is a steroid. Um, this is used in adults for the treatment of uh, acute mountain sickness or the cerebral edema, regardless of age. The dose for adults is four to eight milligrams Q6 hours. And then um, for children, you give it uh, 0 0.15 mg per kg orally Q6 hours with a max dose of four milligrams. You can also give nifedipine. So there's some evidence that suggests that nifedipine could uh, be useful for prevention and or treatment of the pulmonary edema. So it's something to discuss. There's not that much literature that, uh, or any guidelines that say that you should do this, but it is an option. Uh, the dose is 0 0.5 mg per kg every eight hours with a max dose of 20 mg per dose. And you wanna make sure you give the extended release medication. Remember that uh, acetazolamide is a sulfa drug. So if the patient has a, a sulfa allergy, then you, use, then you should use the dexamethasone and skip acetazolamide altogether. Now you can also treat um, acute uh, or altitude sickness um, with a portable hyperbaric bag. So this one is called uh, the gamo bag. It, basically, it's an inflatable pressure bag that a person can actually fit into. Uh, the bags can then be pressurized to an effective altitude thousands of feet lower than the current altitude within minutes. So you can help acclimatize patients um, to a much lower altitude if they're super severe. Okay, so we're going to continue our journey with Chico leading the way. Um, so recovering from his hike, Chico and his crew drove to Aspen to attempt skiing for the first time. Again, to impress this crush, he refused to take lessons and ended up veering off the first slope to be lost in the woods for several hours. He was eventually found by ski patrol later that night, but was incredibly lethargic, breathing very shallowly, and was not shivering. His hands had turned red, and he had no feeling in his feet. So this time, Chico got himself into a really bad case of hypothermia. So hypothermia is defined as a core temperature of less than 35 degrees Celsius. Hypothermia has a mortality rate of 8.45%, and it's more prevalent in infants for the reasons that uh, infants and younger children have a larger surface area to volume ratio, 
Um, they're also unable to shiver. And then they have decreased glycogen stores. It's important to note that uh, you, when you're testing the temperature in uh, children, or you know anyone, you may have to use a low reading thermometer because thermometers actually only go down so far. Um, and then oral, axillary, and cutaneous measurements are completely unre unreliable. So if you can, do a rectal. Now, what happens when one gets hypothermia? So when the core temperature drops below 37 degrees, um, you get non-shivering thermogenesis, uh, thermogenesis initially and shivering. Uh, the patient undergoes peripheral vasoconstriction and piloerection, uh, which is when the hairs stick up to trap more air. Eventually, you get a failure of homeostasis. So once, uh, you know, the body continues to be exposed to these, these ho uh, horribly cold temperatures, the basal metabolic rate decreases. So at 28 degrees Celsius, it drops all the way to 50%. Uh, there's respiratory depression, hypovolemia, decreased cardiac output, and then various conduction abnormalities. So the most common are bradycardia, T-wave inversion, and then you could get the appearance of these pathognomonic J waves. So if you see these J waves, which you can see pictured here on the slide, then this patient definitely has, you know, some pretty bad um, hypothermia. Also, like um, once the temperature continues to drop, if it gets below 28 degrees, uh, V-fib becomes super likely. So, you know, the patient could just straight up die. And then there's also progressive CNS depression. So uh, every fall of one degree Celsius produces a six to 7% decline in cerebral blood flow. So this is just a table that summarizes kind of what I talked about. Um, you can classify hypothermia, mild, moderate, severe, and then, you know, you're dead. Uh, so like you stop losing shivering uh, approximately below 32 degrees Celsius. So that's when you really need to like notice it. That's when like the patient's not gonna do well and then they lose consciousness after 28 degrees. So that's really bad. Uh, you lose vital signs around um, the loss or uh, around the temperature of 24 degrees. And then after that, the patient's most likely just not going to make it, which is unfortunate. <sighs> Excuse me. Okay. So in terms of what you do to help manage these patients that have hypothermia, you need to make sure you handle them very carefully. Um, note that cardiac arrest can occur at any point whenever the warm uh, core blood kind of begins to circulate and rapidly cool. So you want to make sure that you keep them horizontal, separate the patients from the ground right away, uh, change any wet clothing um, if possible. Remember that cotton is the worst, right? So cotton kills. Um, remove patients carefully, keep them horizontal as I've already mentioned. Um, and if the temperature is less than 30 degrees and the patient has cardiac arrest, uh, perform CPR until their temperature hits 30 degrees. The reason why is because if you have an AED, it won't do anything um, below a core temperature of 30 degrees Celsius. So until you can get them warm enough to 30, just continue CPR. And then the defibrillator could potentially help. Now there's uh, multiple ways of rewarming patients. Passive rewarming involves removing cold or wet clothing and applying dry insulation like blankets in a warm environment. Um, so this is what you use in mild hypoth uh, hypothermia with the temperatures greater than 32 degrees Celsius. Um, external active rewarming, um, that should accompany passive rewarming. Uh, but note that this can cause this thing called an after drop. Um, so this usually includes forced air rewarming, radiant heat, heat packs um, to like the groin and stuff like that. Um, the issue is that this can cause further cooling of the core body temperature and uh, hypotension, or what's termed as rewarming shock. Um, this is kind of what I talked about earlier, that once the warm core blood kind of circulates, um, the body can essentially just go into shock, and then you could um, you, know, you become super hypotensive, and you may uh, lose uh, cardiac function. Then there's core active rewarming. So this includes things like warm um, IV, uh, IV fluids. So that's between like 40 to 44 degrees Celsius, uh, warm uh, lavage or peritoneal dialysis or warmed ECMO. So if you get to this point, I mean, they're not usually very effective. Um, these are reserved for when everything else has failed. Um, there's not that much data that shows that these work that well, but like, you know, if you have to do it, you have to do it. Now, this is just an algorithm that uh, demonstrates kind of what I just talked about. This is just for your reference. And then something that I thought was cool was that the, uh, the Canadian government actually created this thing called the cold card. Um, so it's cut up here, so it fits on the slide, but it's available 
uh, to download and print. And it provides guidance for everything that I just talked about. So it's almost exactly um, uh, similar to the slides uh, before this. So you can get it at this website. All right, so also within this realm is frostbite. So um, there's a couple types of frostbite. First off is frost nip. So frost nip is a superficial injury. Um, this is cold induced localized paresthesias that resolve with rewarming. Next up is something I didn't know before, before I started doing this lecture is pernio. So pernio is something that usually happens in young women. It's localized inflammation from repetitive exposure to damp cold. So you present with these like skin findings up at the top of the screen. Then frostbite is just straight up like um, damage to the tissue. So at first frostbite usually doesn't look that bad. Um, it's often just pale, hard skin, but tissue can blister. And once that happens, it's susceptible to gang uh, gangrene. So that's really bad. So frostbite is severe localized cold induced injury due to freezing of the actual tissue. Um, and it's important to know that children are at greater risk of frostbite because of their higher body surface area to mass ratio, less subcutaneous fat, and the most often places that children end up getting frostbite is like their fingers, their toes, their ears, and their nose. But that's kind of self-explanatory. When you have patients with frostbite, you want to make sure that you avoid cycles of thawing and refreezing. You want to thaw them once, thaw with 40 degrees Celsius water, and let them know it's going to hurt. It hurts a lot. And then if they need tetanus prophylaxis for, you know, if they're not immunized, make sure you give them that as well. All right, so we're about halfway through his journey. Uh, now he makes his way to Moab. So uh, having survived the tundra, Chico was excited about hiking to the Red Rock formations in Utah. However, in a valiant effort to appear strong, he only brought one 16-ounce bottle of water for their day-long hike in the desert. His stomach cramped up on the way to the delicate arch, but he paid it no mind. On the journey back, he ran out of water and became incredibly exhausted. During one of the frequent breaks, he started hallucinating and eventually passed out from the heat. This time, Chico ended up with exertional health, uh, heat illness. So this is the third most common cause of exercise-related mortality among high school athletes and children are at higher risk of getting exertional heat illness compared to adults. This is because they have a higher metabolic rate, which means they end up producing more heat. Um, their core temperature rises faster during dehydration. And then in children, they obviously have smaller organs, so they're not super efficient at heat dissipation. It's important to note that the morbidity and mortality are directly related to the duration of core temperature elevation. So similar to what we were talking about with the drowning on the first topic, um, the outcome for these patients is limited to how, like, uh, how long they're kind of exposed uh, to the condition that kind of causes uh, what's going on. So what happens? Um, so the pathophysiology, you get a rise in core temperature. Um, as, the, as you get a rise in core temperature, the hypothalamus stimulates the autonomic nervous system to produce uh, a sweating and cutaneous vasodilatation um, to allow for reduction of body heat. Now, evaporation is the principal mechanism of heat loss. Um, however, this is ineffective when you're in a super high humidity of 75% or more. Now, this temperature elevation is accompanied by an increased uh, basal metabolic rate, and then patients end up getting tachypnic and tachycardic. Now, what's very important to know is that there's something called the critical thermal maximum. Um, this is defined as the degree of elevated body temperature and duration of heat exposure that can be tolerated before cell damage occurs. Uh, children sustain serious heat-related injury when the CTM is exceeded. So the absolute number is uh, 42 degrees Celsius or 107.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, if this lasts anywhere between 45 minutes or eight hours, uh, there's gonna be some significant, significant issues long-term. The prognosis gets much worse. Um, at 42 degrees, um, basically what happens is that oxidative phosphorylation uncouples and enzymes end up denaturing. So that's why outcomes end up being super bad once you hit that temperature. So there's a couple of types of exertional heat illness. Um, the first is uh, heat cramps, which I'm sure we've all gotten at some point, right? Brief intermittent excruciating cramps. They kind of go away, usually due to electrolyte depletion. Uh, most spasms last, le last less than a minute, but some can persist for several minutes. Excuse me. Next is heat exhaustion. So patients usually present with lethargy, thirst, headache, vomiting. You can have some CNS issues, uh, hypotension, and tachycardia. If this is left untreated, 
and patients can progress from heat exhaustion to frank heat stroke, which is bad. So that's when you have hyperpyrexia greater than 41 degrees Celsius and hydrosis, severe CNS dysfunction, which can be abrupt and can include things, you know, from loss of consciousness, seizure, or even like a sense of doom. Um, patients here end up having a rapid and full pulse with an increased pulse pressure. Um, so if, they're, if you're given vitals for like a test question or something like that, that's how you can kind of know the difference between um, how this presents. This just kind of talks about the same thing in an up-to-date table here for your reference. So how do you fix this? Um, so obviously the first thing is to remove the source of heat. So remove all clothing from the patient, any equipment they might have on, like if they're playing sports, you know, they're playing football or something, take all their pads off, uh, move the patient to the shade, give oral rehydration with electrolytes if you're able to, and then you wanna begin uh, rapid cooling. So place ice packs on the neck, the groin, the axilla, uh, do ice water immersion if you're able to, and then you wanna cool the patient until they begin to shiver. And you wanna make sure that you start this process as soon as possible, which again, is kind of self-explanatory. Now, it's very important to note that for children, specifically young children, um, you don't want to give them like water or Kool-Aid or any other hypotonic fluid. Um, you want to try and give them salty drinks if you can, like tomato juice, you know, Gatorade, give them some salty foods just because their electrolytes are way out of whack compared to, you know, an adolescent or if one of us were to um, kind of be in the situation. Now, the big thing is prevention. You want to be able to counsel patients in your clinic or wherever so that way this doesn't happen or it doesn't happen again. So you want to make sure you educate parents on the site of uh, on the signs of heat illness in children. So basically kind of like what we talked about. You want to make sure you tell them to wear appropriate clothing for those hot environments. And you want them to take frequent breaks to hydrate and cool on hot days. And then you want to hydrate with water and electrolytes to ensure adequate absor uh, absorption. Now, something that um, you can kind of tell your patients, and it's great to know as physicians or med students or any sort of practitioner, um, is how to make uh, ORS, which is oral rehydration solution. So you don't need to buy expensive Gatorade. In fact, Gatorade is sweeter than like actual ORS needs to be. Um, so to make your own ORS, so this is great for if you're out like you know hiking or whatever, if you're out in the wilderness, or if you're out in a developing country, um, you start with one liter of water, you add one teaspoon of salt, eight teaspoons of sugar. Easy recipe, and then this makes an adequate oral rehydration solution um, that you can down or tell other people to down uh, to help prevent exertional heat illness and ensure that uh, the patients are adequately absorbing the water plus the electrolytes. Now, real quick, uh, something that's very specific to pediatrics is um, unattended vehicles. So 894 children have died um, due to pediatric vehicular heat stroke since the year 1998. That's a lot. Um, basically, how this works is that ambient temperature rises really quickly in parked vehicles, which is not really a surprise. We've all been in a parked car before. Um, studies have shown that cracking the window has very little effect. You know, it, it helps with less than three degrees. Um, and the cool thing is that 21 states um, have uh, unattended clinic, or sorry, unattended child and vehicle laws that have specific language that actually addresses leaving a child uh, unattended in a vehicle. The only issue is that's only 21 states and there's 50 states, right? Um, so it's very important to reinforce the parents specifically that like you never want to leave your child unattended in a vehicle. And then for you, um, if you ever see that at, you know, a uh, grocery store, or if you're at a Walgreens or whatever, make sure you call 911 because this is an actual offense that uh, people can um, be put in jail for and you could potentially save a life. Okay, so we got about uh, two more uh, clinical cases. So Chico, after almost dying four times now, uh, Chico felt invincible in a last ditch attempt to impress his crush. He really loves this person. Uh, he plotted to capture her a rattlesnake during the gang's hike through the Grand Canyon. Naturally, this didn't play over well, and his friends were awakened in the middle of the night by a shriek. Chico was found 500 feet away, clutching his leg, covering up what appeared to be two fang marks on his shin. A distant rattle could be heard. His crush, having had enough of this, his antics, caught the next flight home. Poor Chico. <laughs> 
So real quick, we'll talk about snake bites. So 15% of the snakes in the United States secrete venom. There are two uh, basically types of snakes, um, two uh, genuses. Uh, there's pit vipers, um, or genus uh, Crotalidae, and then coral snakes, or genus um, Elapidae. I probably butchered that. Um, so these are two types of, um, of snakes that are in the United States that end up secreting venom. Um, Seven to 8,000 people a year are bitten by a snake in the United States. That's a lot. Um, most of them are males. So, you know, adolescent boys, five to 19 years old. Um, and, you know, most of the time it's associated with drug or alcohol intoxication. And it's often provoked when people try and catch wild snakes. So just like little Chico here, I mean, that's usually the case as to why people end up getting bitten by snakes. Cool thing that I learned was that even decapitated or dead snakes can actually bite and release venom. So figured that was really interesting. Now, how do I identify the different snake bites? So for pit vipers, um, they have heat sensitive pits on either side of their head between the eye and the nostril. Um, you can also distinguish them from uh, other non-venomous snakes by uh, they have uh, vertical elliptical pupils, curved fangs, and they have a triangular head. So the most common pit vipers include the rattlesnake, uh, the copperhead, and the water moccasin. Then there's the coral snake. Uh, so the coral snake ends up having, uh, they have round pupils with a blunt head. And then what's important is that they have um, black, yellow, black, yellow, red, black coloring. Um, so many snakes kind of imitate this. Um, I think it's the king snake, I could be wrong. But I think it's the king snake that uh, has a very similar coloring, but for them, it's a red on black. Well, here the red uh, touches the yellow. So if you ever see uh, red touching yellow, red on yellow, kill a fellow, red on black, venom black. So that's important to know because other snakes would, you know, try and like reap the benefits of imitating these snakes. But really, it's only the coral snake that's going to be dangerous. So what to look for? So for pit viper bites, initially there's immediate uh, intense local pain and burning in the area of the bite. There can be perioral numbness that can extend to the scalp. Patients can have a metallic taste. And then about a day, they can start to have ecchymoses and hemorrhagic bullae develop. This can be really bad um, because depending on how much toxin they have, um, this could progress to necrosis of the bitten extremity and DIC, which is systemic. Patients can also have nausea, vomiting, weakness, chills, sweating, other systemic signs as well, along with the bleeding and the hypotension if they are in frank DIC. For coral snakes, uh, the involvement ends, ends up being more like CNS. So like these patients end up having like extremity paresthesias, weakness, diplopia, dysarthria, dysphagia. So like it kind of looks like a stroke and then you could potentially get a respiratory failure. So they present very differently. Make sure that you inspect the wound for these patients for the fang punctures um, and make sure that there's actually like two present. And then make sure you try and measure the distance between the two fang marks if possible, because then you can guess the size of the snake and therefore you can see how much venom, you know, they could have potentially been injected with. All right, so what do you do? Um, so when it comes to the venom itself, um, it's full of proteinases that uh, induce increased endothelial permeability. This leads to hemolysis, fibrinolysis, plasminogen activation, and thrombocytopenia. So again, that's like the whole DIC thing. So when you encounter a patient that has a snake bite, you want to make sure you remove the patient from the snake's territory and try and identify the snake. Like if you can see the snake, that makes your life easier. Um, immobilize the extremity, make it lower than the level of the heart, clean the wound superficially with soap and water, and then do not apply pressure immobilization. Do not apply tourniquets and do not apply constrictive dressing, uh, dressing. And also do not attempt to suck out the venom with your mouth or any sort of other uh, suction device. Although this is mentioned as a potential for safe therapy uh, by the uh, American Heart Association, no clinical studies in human patients have demonstrated a benefit. In fact, tourniquets and other types of compression can actually um, damage nerves, tendons, blood vessels, and the oral suction can end up leading to super infection, which why do that if there's no benefit? 
So if there's a mild envenomation um, of a pit viper, that usually presents with swelling, pain, ecchymosis adjacent to the bite. For these children and these patients, you want to observe them for a minimum of eight hours, preferably in an emergency room, turn their coags, and then you know you do you watch them longer if necessary if they seem to clinically progress. For moderate to severe envenomation, that means that the patient has a bite on the head, the neck, or the trunk, uh, their airway for whatever reason is threatened, or they end up developing compartment syndrome from all the swelling. You want to give the antivenom for pit viper. So it's called Crofab. That's the brand name. You want to give it within six hours of the snake bite. Uh, the pediatric dose is the same as the adult dose. And it's actually based on the amount of venom that's injected rather than body weight. Then for coral snakes, um, if the patient is symptomatic with neurologic symptoms, you should give them antivenom. The reason why you know they have to be symptomatic with these like neurologic symptoms is because the uh, antivenom is actually very rare for coral snakes um, and it's in low supply. Um, otherwise, you know, there's some literature that says that you can symptomatically treat patients with anticholinesterases, so you can give them like atropine, or you can like maybe give them neostigmine, but I don't know how much uh, efficacy there is to that. The next up, we've got spider bites. Uh, so there's a couple of uh, different types of spiders, more than 100,000 species of spiders. Most of them are shy. Most of them won't bite unless you provoke them. Um, and most of them have mild venom and fangs that are too short and fragile to even penetrate human skin. But some of the most dangerous species include the brown recluse. So this spider is endemic to the South, the Midwest, and the Western United States. And it has like this distinctive three pairs of eyes. Its venom is cytotoxic and it has uh, high L uronidase like properties. And that leads to um, the initial presentation being like this little red plaque that could start off painless, but then it can develop necrosis ulceration after a couple of days. And that can pro uh, progress to hemolysis and rhabdo in children. So that's kind of a big deal. Most bites without necrosis um, just require observation. But if there is necrosis, like you see here, um, the patient may require surgical debridement. So consult your surgery friends. And do note that there is no antivenom for the brown recluse. So it's all like expected management, unless there's a surgical emergency. Now we're all famous with the black widow. The black widow is the leading cause of death from spider bites in the United States. It's endemic to the South, the Midwest, and the Western United States. And it has this distinctive red hourglass abdominal marking. So the way it presents is with this blanched circular patch with a red perimeter and a central punctum. Its venom is neurotoxic. Um, and then patients usually have muscle pain, rigidity, about you know, somewhere between an hour to eight hours after the bite. They can also get abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, cardiopulmonary distress as well. Now to treat children, you really only treat them if they're greater than 40 kilograms or sorry, you don't really treat them if they're greater than 40 kilograms or they have normal vitals. And if they only have like local symptoms, the care for that population is supportive. It's the same for adults. For children that are less than 40 kilograms, you wanna make sure you give them antivenom regardless of their symptoms. And the reason why is that mortality can be as high as 50% if it's left untreated in this uh, young population. All right, so we're almost done. Finally, on his way back to Florida, uh, Chico's friends were driving him through a thunderstorm. Lightning shot across the sky, quickly followed by a thunderous roar. Uh, Chico, who was intoxicated, asked to pull over to get a picture with him and the lightning for his new Tinder profile. He posed on top of a hill with a hammer, shouted for Asgard as lightning struck. However, after a bright flash, he was found on the ground, unresponsive, without a pulse. Here lies Chico, um, he got struck by lightning. So lightning strike has a 30% mortality rate, killing about 100 people every year. The death rate is highest in people that are aged uh, 15 to 19, and two thirds of these deaths occur within one hour of the initial injury. Because of the variability of tissue resistance, surface area, volume of tissue exposed, it's extremely difficult to predict the actual course of current flow, but the severity of the electrical injury depends on six, six factors. So resistance of the body, basically, the types of currents, uh, whether it's AC versus DC, the frequency of the current, 
the intensity of the voltage, the duration of contact, and the pathway that the, uh, the current actually took through the body. On average, lightning is a DC current. Um, it usually strikes and lasts for about one tenth to one one thousandth of a second. Um, often is at uh, greater than 10 million volts and can get as hot as 30,000 Kelvin. So, I mean, that's a lot. You can't even quantify how, like, I can't even believe how hot that is. So what happens? So when someone gets struck by lightning, uh, victims are commonly found pulseless, apneic, and unresponsive. That's usually what happens. Uh, the current that passes directly through the heart may induce necrosis, V-fib, or even asystole, from which the heart may respond uh, spontaneously, but like accompanying respiratory failure is commonly prolonged. Um, usually, uh, unless ventilation is initiated promptly, this hypoxia leads to secondary V-fib and death. So that makes sense. Um, on the skin, patients usually have full thickness burns. It's very important to know that the surface injury whatever you see on the skin does not correlate potentially uh, or does not correlate with any sort of potential internal injury the patient might have um, underwent in the kidneys uh, they end up getting rhabdo and um, pigment induced acute kidney injury neuro wise patients can get um, cns and pns injury with possible autonomic involvement as well so it can range from things like coma, seizure, memory dysfunction, autonomic dysfunction, any sort of deficit really. Vascular-wise, patients can have spontaneous thrombosis, small and large vessels all over the place. MSK, there's osteonecrosis, acute compartment syndrome is also possible. Um, and then in the ears and the, uh, the eyes, patients often get cataracts, hyphema, vitreous hemorrhages, and then tympanic rupture is also very common. And then other things that could potentially happen are visceral rupture, pleural effusions, and pneumonitis. So a very wide presentation of a lot of bad things, essentially. So what do we tell people so that way they don't get struck by lightning? So um, management obviously involves CPR and resuscitation and any supportive care if there's any burns or renal injury. The key is going to be prevention and anticipatory guidance. Most lightning strikes happen outdoors, which, you know, yeah, it makes sense. If the weather forecast calls for thunderstorms, tell patients that you want them to postpone their trip or activities if possible. Um, we tell them when thunder roars, go indoors. You want them to find a safe and closed shelter. So this includes hardtop vehicles, which are grounded with the tires. Um, and then there's this 30-30 rule. So after seeing lightning, you tell them to count to 30. If you hear thunder before you reach 30, you want them to go indoors and suspend any activities for at least 30 minutes after that last clap of thunder. Otherwise, there's a higher risk of lightning striking. If patients are stuck outside, tell them to crouch low to the ground, cover their ears, never lie down, um, and then get off any hills, stay away from any water, and then stay away from any concrete or metal, because concrete is often reinforced with metal bars. All right, so that's everything that I have. Um, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for listening uh, and thank my mentor who helped me when I made this for uh, Grand Rounds a couple of months ago. And uh, thanks to Chico for his sacrifice and multiple injuries for the purpose of our education. Dr. Fayed, thank sorry, go ahead, Karen. I just want to say thank you so much. It was a great lecture. We had a great time. If anyone does have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Kira is going to take over asking any, any questions you might have. Yeah, pl please feel free to reach out um, if you have any questions. I guess I have questions while everyone's thinking of some. Um, can you sort of like develop a tolerance for altitude um, with like repeated exposure? Uh, that's a really good question. I don't know the exact answer to that. I know that if you do it over a very long period of time, um, so let's say like you move, like, you know, people who move to like Denver, for example, um, you do develop, you acclimatize uh, to that new um, altitude level. But I don't know the answer if you do it frequently. Like if you go like yearly, for example, I, I would presume no, uh, because you would again reacclimatize after you would come back home, for example. So let's say you go to somewhere that's like two miles high. You spend like six months there and then you spend the next six months back at like sea level. 
you're going to reacclimatize. So I feel like you wouldn't become more or like you would have the same susceptibility because you would still have to acclimatize. But I don't know. I don't know the exact answer. That's just my speculation. That's a really good question. Um, and like, what kind of like temperature ranges are you seeing with that after drop when you're rewarming after hypothermia? Uh, so, I mean, I, I don't know exactly when that happens. I, I just know that it happens like when you're doing the, the um, when you're specifically doing that type of rewarming. I don't know if it happens at a specific uh, temperature. More just like, like, is it like uh, one or two degrees or is it like 10? I just wasn't sure like what, how much like your temperature drops. Uh, it would probably be like a couple, like more than just one or two degrees. I mean, essentially whenever you're making any changes to anything, like how we correct um, for like hyperatremia and stuff like that, you want to do everything very slowly just because you can cause massive fluid shifts. You can cause um, like massive issues. Um, and, and, uh, this after drop or this, basically this hypotension is an example, another example of that happening. Um, so it would probably happen not with just a change of degrees of like one to two, would probably like if you rapidly, um, uh, rewarm them from like 28 to like 35 or something. Okay. So the after drop is like less of like a core temperature. So it's like the, it's referring to like the hypotension and not like a blood temperature change correct yeah okay. yeah it's hypotension it's basically it's shock it's shock that happens from the from the rapid change in temperature as the cold and warm blood kind of mix together way too quickly and then the, the systemic vasculature just goes into shock um, what's like the mechanism behind the heart instability with cold injuries Well, everything cools down. So like, because it's, it's frozen, you know, you're going to have, therefore, like you're going to have um, the muscles end up tightening, tightening up. Um, the, that leads to um, issues with uh, conduction. And then basically once you have conduction abnormalities, they just continue and continue as the heart gets colder and colder and colder. Um, so that's why initially you just get like, you know, bradycardia, but then like eventually you get those EKG changes. And then if you keep going, um, the electricity is not going to be flowing as well. And then you end up with straight up arrhythmias, ventricular fibrillation. Um, and then you end up having to go into patient. So it's like less of like an alkalosis or like a potassium imbalance and more like just physically being cold. It's probably a combination of all of that, to be honest, because everything's so out of whack when you're uh, at that such a low of a temperature. I mean, like I'm sure that the, the channels like the sodium channels, potassium channels are also aren't working um, entirely. Uh, to like the normal standard that they would be working when you're when your heart's that cold. Um, Should eight pads not be put up on a patient in cardiac arrest until they were not? So you always want to make sure you put AD pads on someone. So like that's part of just like ACLS. Sorry. So I think someone sent a direct message to me. This is Anna Gardner. Um, so the message is like, um, you mentioned that defib won't work below a certain temperature. Should AD pads not be put on a patient in cardiac arrest until they warm up? Um, if so, how do you know when they reach the temperature so that the defibrillator will work? Um, so like part of basic ACLS is that you all, like you want to get the pads on right away. You just don't shock them. I'm like you can shock them at, when they're at 27. It's just not going to do anything. But you always want to make sure you get the pads on. Um, and like if you're in the forest or something, like I mean, it's highly unlikely you'll have a continuous temperature monitor with you in your bag. But if you do, <laughs> I would stick that up the patients like, you know, stick it up their mucosa, probably in their rectum and monitor that until they're around 30 uh, if you are coding them so that way then you know okay now it's an appropriate time to um to actually shock the patient most likely that's something that would happen like an er setting though or at least in an ambulance um what about like uh the reasoning for like the tetanus prophylaxis with frostbite is it just like open wound yeah just open wound with any open wound so like like theoretically you should do that for all the bites and all that stuff too i just mentioned it there but you should be considering that whenever you have any wound that comes to the er you always want to consider the patient specific uh situation so like whether or not they've had immunization before if they're completely immunized specifically if they're children whether or not you need to give um like the actual um toxin or you know all that sort of stuff All right. 
if that's everything, thank you again so much. Thank you for presenting, even though you're, you're sick. We hope you get better soon. No worries. I'm happy to be here. Hopefully you guys learned something. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone. And we'll see you next time. Take care, everyone. Mm -hmm.